Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. Hello, welcome to Connecting the Dots on my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Claude Anderson, your host. Here again, they bring some facts to you and so, uh, somehow explain a lot of the issues that pertain to black folk from a historical standpoint up until the present time. Let's use one thing, that's, let's, let's talk about something that's very popular in American society, but most people don't understand what they're talking about when they bring it up. It's about race matters. And what they ask, what is race and what is racism? And I've yet to find very many people that know. As a matter of fact, at one time, I used to go around the world and I would give people, offer to give people $100, they'd tell me what racism was. And they do, you know, invariably, I couldn't find one person that could explain what racism was because they use the definitions that are being put, put, perpetuated by the dominant white society. But let's find out what racism and track it. Let's go back in history now. See, if you go back in history, let's go back to about the 1450s, in, as an instance. In about 1450, there were... Uh, you, to be it, to have, there was no such thing as a race. What they had in those days, they had tribes, they had religious groups, and they had nations. That was it. Those three things, tribes, nations, and uh, and religions. But they, they, there was no such thing as race. But about 1445 to 1450, at that particular time, a guy named Henry the Navigator went off the coast of Africa. And uh, he picked up uh, about 16 blacks. And, and took him back to Portugal and to Italy. And he got back there. He gave me gave him to the to the Catholic Church as a gift and suggested they can use them however they saw fit. And they used the Catholic Church, the reason they gave him to the Catholic Church, you see, was because uh, prior to that time, the Catholic Church sort of played the role of a, being an, an advocate and a, and a consoler for people who were slaves. Because to be a slave in that time, you know, you had again, as I said, be um, uh, be persecuted for being either for indebtedness or for religious persecution or a victim of a war, a prisoner of war. And so the, the Catholic Church is playing the role of being a great consoler, come in and comfort you. And so when Henry the Navigator uh, gave those, those 16 blacks to the Catholic Church in about 1445, 1450, they kept them and used them. What we do, we use them as slaves, as servants in the Catholic Church. And they use them in that in that role from about about 1445, 1450 up until about 8, 1488. And in 1488, uh, a guy named Pope Innocent, he says, you know, we found out over this over this 40 some year period, uh, you know, having these blacks around, that's a good thing. And uh, because we never had them before, as I said before, to be a to be a a, a, a slave, you had to be uh, either in, indebted to someone or religiously being persecuted or prisoner of war. But these were neither of those things. So they said, well, this is a good thing. And so at that point in time, they injected the, the word race into the uh, race popped up. <laughs> not, not necessarily at that point, but around that point. And by saying, OK, what we're going to do now is just use them in any capacity we could. Then about four or five years later, Henry the Navigator uh, after Henry Navigator gave all these things to the Catholic Church, Columbus sailed to the around the world in hopes of finding new land and, and valuables and golds. And matter of fact, even find dope and sugar. And he ran into a continent over here called North America, North American continent. He landed there and then, and he found out that it was pretty much uninhabited except for 
a few by maybe 100, 100, 200,000 at max Indians running around the land. And it was pre pre pretty much uninhabited. He went back to Europe. And so by, 15, by the early 1500s, it was a, ma a major thing was going on across the world. That the, and uh, starting in Europe, they were suffering from famine, diseases, food shortages, and, and crime. And they, and they needed to do something to resuscitate the entire European continent. And, uh, and they were looking for a hope. So when, when the Columbus came back and said, I found all this land and uh, it's, it's, it's uninhabited, that's when, that's when racism started right there. It picked up going all the way back to Henry the Navigator up to this point. Racism started at that point. How did it start? Because then they said, you know what? We need to go find and inhabit that land and try to use it that has value. But how are we gonna do it? And people said, well, remember what Pope Innocent said back in 1887, I mean in 1487, let's use those people called blacks, use them as a labor class. And, um, and we're gonna change the whole concept of how to get wealth and power and save this continent. The entire European continent was going down the toilet. It's what we do then, we'll combine things. Instead of being practicing mercantilism, as we've been using, doing up to this point in time, Let's, 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 let's come up with a new concept and where you can only control, get the land, get the tools and the resources and use someone else's labor and then enrich yourself, that becomes capitalism. And that's where the some concept of capitalism started. But let's go back to the concept about race. So a race started, <clears throat> nine European nations, <clears throat> Italy, France, Germany, the rest of them said they got into a race. So let's, let's try to see who can be the first one to get over in those countries to North America, South America, Central America, and the, and the Caribbean and use black labor to enrich ourselves. They were in a race, a race to, to develop wealth and power by going and extracting the resources out of America or owning and controlling land and the tools and using black labor to enrich themselves. That's where race came. That was a race. A race is a contest. They began to compete. That's why you heard me say on a number of occasions before, learning how to compete. And as they began to compete as nations, um, they competed from, a, from about the early 1500s all the way up until about 1857, right on the eve of the Civil War. And that's when the race ended. The race ended, that was a 300 year, but the race ended then, you know why it ended? Because at that point in time, those European nations who had all pitched in together, as well as some Asian nations and, uh, and Latin America, they had pitched in together to exploit black labor and all the resources have been transferred into the hands of non-blacks. And the race was over in, 1580, in, uh, in 1859. And when the race ended, they took the E off of race and stuck a suffix called ISM, which means, means sustain and, and, and hold on to the prevailing conditions. At that particular time in 1859, whites owned almost 99% of everything in America. And black slaves owned practically nothing. You had about almost four and a half to five million slaves, but they owned practically nothing. And uh, the only people, and the few blacks that had gotten something was uh, you had about 200 some thousand blacks that were free. Collectively, they had one half or 1% of anything of value. At that point in 1859, the race ended. And they took the E off a of race and stuck the suffix ISM. That's where racism came from. It had nothing to do with, with minorities and poor folk and people of color. It had to do strictly with black people and whites, which means all the wealth and resources had been and land, ownership, rights, privileges, businesses, income, and all have been transferred into the hands of the dominant white society. And consequently, from that point on, whites would only control everything in the country. And that was what racism was. At any time black folk asked for anything, for reparations or affirmative action, or any preferential treatment, anything, you sort of be in an opposition to it. Whites <clears throat> and their sub-ethnics were to oppose anything that would allow the conditions of black folk to change. Whites were in 1859 on the eve of the Civil War. Whites in America, they were 100 foot giants and black folk were one foot midgets <laughs> to make sure they only controlled nothing, had no power and resources. And that's where racism came from. It's remained unchanged until the time, up until this time. But what's happening now, <clears throat> to keep black folk confused, they want to pretend that racism also is the same as bias, bigotry, hatred, personal attitudes, or discrimination. Those things have nothing to do with 
everybody discriminates. Even in a family, you can discriminate, but you can have five kids and discriminate between them. That has nothing to do with racism. And see, black folk have must learn that and understand that black people can never be racist. All they can do in America is react to white racism. Blacks don't have the power to enslave, Jim Crow, segregate, or mistreat anybody in America. And racism is an issue between blacks and whites. It has nothing to do with language groups or culture groups <clears throat> or other groups coming to America. It is our uh, gays, a midget. It has to do with black people, blacks and whites. And so now that you understand racism, be on the guard. Don't let anybody use those terms in front of you to confuse it and mix it with things that, that don't pertain to black folk. White folks started misusing the word race after 1959 and told black folk it has to do with how you feel about somebody it, but it, and how you, whether you like them or not. Racism started off as an economic issue between blacks and whites. It is still an economic issue between blacks and whites. Now, as you know, go forward, produce wealth and power for our people. Take care, and I'll see you next week on Connecting the Dots. This is Dr. Claude Anderson signing off. So my name is Ibram X. Kendi, and I'm the author of, of How to Be an Anti-Racist. And this book really seeks to show that the contrast is actually not between racist and not racist, but the contrast is between racist and anti-racist. What I think many people who I self-identify as, as not racist don't realize is that really over the course of, of history, nearly every group of people that we actually consider to be racist have also identified as, 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 as not racist, whether that's white supremacist today or segregationist of, of yesterday. And so really, each of us should be striving to be anti-racist, not necessarily striving to be not racist, because really that's a term primarily of denial. And it's a term really that doesn't have much meaning. But it does mean something to be racist. When, when someone says that there's something wrong with a racial group, they're being racist. When, when someone says there's nothing wrong with any of the racial groups, they're being anti-racist. When, when someone supports policies that create and reproduce racial inequity, they're being racist. When someone supports policies that yield and create racial equity, they're being an anti-racist. And these aren't necessarily identities or, or fixed categories or tattoos. Literally, what we're doing in each moment determines who, who and what we are in each moment. And people change from moment to moment and, and from year to year. And I think we should identify people based on what they're saying and doing because no one ever becomes racist or even anti-racist.